This is Indiana in the Morning, presented by First Commonwealth Bank here on the Voice of Indiana County, WCCS, AM 1160 and 101.1 FM. Our interviews are presented by Marcus and Mack, a law firm representing injured people. It's time now for our martial law segment, but before we dive into it, we do have to say this. This radio program is intended to be for informational purposes only. This information does not constitute legal advice. The law is constantly changing, and the information may not be complete or correct depending on the date and your particular legal problem. Each legal problem depends on its individual facts, and different jurisdictions have different laws and regulations. Because of these differences, you should not act or rely on any information in this segment without seeking the advice of a competent attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction for your particular problem. Now that that's out of the way, let's welcome on the phone uh, we, our good friend Marshall Criswell. Marshall, good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Doing excellent. It's great to talk to you once again. And today we're going to talk about something that I think a lot of people might have on their minds, how secure everything is, especially with keeping things confidential between, I guess, a lawyer and a client. And and I know that that is a very, very privileged area right there because privacy is something that is very key when it comes to a relationship between a client and an attorney. Absolutely. Um, It is one of the uh, most important uh, ethical obligations that an attorney has is to maintain uh, the, the confidences of the client, maintain confidential uh, the information that's gained as part of the representation of a client. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the rule uh, of professional responsibility uh, states that a lawyer shall not reveal information relating to the representation of a client unless the client gives informed consent um, or that the, the, dis- the disclosure is authorized in order to carry out the representation. So there are very narrow exceptions um, to the rule. But by and large, anything that an attorney learns or uh, documents that are obtained, uh, information that's obtained um, during the course of representation must stay confidential. That's just one of the many tenets of ethics that the uh, that lawyers do have to follow, and it's something that is taken very seriously. I know that within your law firm, you take it very seriously. Uh, well, we absolutely do. I mean, we're bound by the ethical rules, and uh, it you know the, um, the the duty of confidentiality is is absolutely central to the lawyer client relationship. The client needs to have the confidence that they can tell their attorney anything. Um, and that is really the only way. It, it's, it goes both ways, right? It's so important, and it's a legal obligation for the, for the attorney to maintain that confidentiality, but it is, it, it's also very important that the, uh, that the client be able to provide and that they do provide uh, truthful and, and complete information to their attorney to obtain the best representation. So that's why it's so central um, that we have these confidentiality rules. I'm actually looking up something on the ABA Journal right now about lawyers being mindful of being co- of the duty of confidentiality when they engage in public commentary, and they cite as examples online postings, blogs, and things like that. That was according to a recent ethics opinion of the ABA. I'm sure you probably heard a lot about that. Uh, certainly, um, and that's an issue that um, that uh, you know it comes up in a lot of different contexts. Uh, attorneys have to be very careful. Um, you know, there's there's a, a difference between, um, you, you know, if I'm let's say I'm giving a presentation uh, to uh, another group of attorneys or or uh, to to uh, you know a, any group, and I'm using examples um, of different because it's very useful, right, to use examples of different cases that I've handled to explain situations um, and explain various areas of the law. Mm-hmm. I've got to be extraordinarily careful if, I, if I'm doing that so that I don't say too much that I could divulge uh, who my client was uh, or make it you know, uh, easy for someone to, to guess or to know who, who my client was or what that situation was. So there is a fine line that you're walking all the time. Same thing, like you said, if I'm posting in, on my blog, on, on my website, or, or um, you know, writing an article or something like that got to be very careful with with those things um, so you, you know it's it's really it's it's important sometimes it's 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 difficult you've got to you've got to figure out where those lines are but you know the the, the core uh, rule um, applies to basically all situations talk about uh, some of the other ethics tenants that uh, you uh, that you that all attorneys have to follow sure 
so um, you know another big one right is that we avoid conflicts of interest um, conflicts uh, and you know I think that uh, some people may be confused about what a conflict of interest is um, if I'm you know if I if I'm representing um, someone and uh, you know it, I, I have a client and you know someone comes to me with a case and that client is um, is friends with my other client or they're enemies of my other client or they they're an employer or an employee of my of my other client those things don't necessarily uh, rise to the level of conflict um, you know I I can't take a client uh, I can't take on a matter that would that would have the potential to adversely impact a current client mm-hmm. so that you know that that is it that's a huge ethical responsibility um, and you know there are times when there are um, conflicts of interest that are waivable conflicts. Sometimes I have two clients that say, for example, they they want to uh, buy buy property um, and one uh, and they want to buy it and, and own it jointly. And I'm I'm going to represent both of them uh, to to purchase this this piece of ground. Well, I have two clients that they basically have the same goal, but there could be conflicts between them as to the uh, the terms of the sale and the terms of their joint ownership. But what the ethics rules tell me is that's a waivable conflict. They can sign a, a waiver, and I can represent both of those. Um, but there are a lot of instances where I can't, and I have to turn clients away and say, no, that's a conflict of interest. I can't take it. Mm-hmm. So it, it really is a tricky situation to try to – navigate everything it sounds like especially with a conflict of interest oh yeah absolutely um and uh, and again uh, you know these these rules interplay with each other um i you know if i'm uh, turning a client away someone comes to me and with with a matter that they'd like me to take on and i say well no i can't i can't take that i apologize i'll have to refer you to someone else or uh, something and the reason is that I have a conflict of interest. I can't necessarily tell them that, right? Right. Um, because I would be divulging the confidence of my other client. Yeah, it, so, it goes back to confidentiality once again. Jeez, it, it, it does. And and so you really do have to be mindful. And um, you know the uh, the rules of professional conduct um, are generally very very straightforward. Um, but I, again, you you have to. There is some analysis involved sometimes to determine where the lines are. Uh, but there are uh, there are severe consequences for violating them. If I violate the um, uh, the you know the rules of confidentiality or conflicts of interest, and my client is materially harmed because of that, uh, I can face you know uh, public rep- reprimands, suspensions, disbarments. Um, so uh, you, you know you've you've really got to um, you've got to mind your p's and q's when it comes to ethics. All right. This is a hypothetical situation, again, going back to the conflict of interest question. Say you do have to turn somebody down for conflict of interest reasons. Mm -hmm. Can you recommend them to another attorney, say, and just say you might want to talk to this person or, or or to this person over here, and they can help you out? Can you do that? Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I, I can't I can't give that client any advice um, or discuss their situation with them. Uh, but I can, um, you know, refer them to another attorney who practices in that area of law and and, and do that. Absolutely. We're talking with Marshall Criswell for our Marshall Law segment here on Indiana in the Morning. We're talking about uh, ethics. We covered uh, confidentiality and also a conflict of interest. And those are the two big ones that I think people think about whenever they uh, think about contacting a, an attorney, making sure that their information remains private no matter what happens, and also uh, that uh, things don't cross over into a conflict of interest. So, Marshall, uh, no, I'm sure that there are uh, the, what are some of the other tenets that we think of whenever we think of legal ethics? Well, it's interesting. Um, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, evolving um, areas of ethics is an attorney's um, the requirement of an attorney to stay abreast of developments in technology, uh, mm-hmm. which has caused a little bit of uproar in the legal community because the attorneys. Uh, Historically, uh, tend to be a little bit more on the curmudgeon side. We we don't embrace uh, new technology because we um, are nervous about some of the ethical implications of it. Right. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier with blog postings or stuff on social media. Right. Right. 
So, but now uh, the ABA in most states are saying that an attorney actually has an ethical responsibility to uh, keep abreast of technological developments, um, and particularly any software that you're using um, in your practice. Uh, you know, what, one way that you might not think of that we can divulge uh, client secrets, that we can break confidentiality, um, is to uh, you know, to have our system, uh, whether it's a server or a cloud service or whatever, wherever you're storing all your information, if that gets hacked, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, if I didn't do enough in my in my practice to, you know, uh, enact security reg- policies here and to take steps to protect client information, I have tons of client information. You know, whether it's social security numbers or medical records or employment records. Um, that if if that would be um, if I, if I would be hacked if that would be made public that's a breach of my ethical responsibility of confidentiality so but also there are these new rules that say I have to anything I'm using in my office any software I've got to know how that works and I've got to know the security um, uh, um, functionality and liability of that mm-hmm. uh, so you know that's that's something that really has evolved lately um, that uh, that people don't think of. You really do have to know your systems inside and out, it sounds like, to be able to properly take care of them and take care of uh, everyone's information as far as that's concerned. Yeah, and, um, you know, if I were uh, working for, uh, you know, a, a, a big firm in downtown Pittsburgh, I'd probably have an IT department that would do all that for me, and I wouldn't have to give it another minute's thought. Right, but... Uh, but but as, a, as a solo attorney, um, who does, I have, I have um, you know, really built my practice to be... Um, uh, 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 based and rooted in a lot of different technologies that enable me to to um, uh, to work more efficiently. So, as a solo practitioner, you know it's something that I really, really have to be mindful of. All right, well, Marshall, we're just about out of time. So, this was actually pretty uh, educational as far as what ethics and still are, are being followed by attorneys. And if anybody wants to get a hold of you for any uh, legal reasons or for advice, how can they get a hold of you? You can call me at 724-465-5826. Come see me in the R&P Coal Building on Church Street uh, in Indiana or go online to www.westernpalawyer.com. Marshall Criswell, thank you very much for joining us once again here on Indiana in the Morning. I always look forward to hearing these, uh, these little tidbits about the legal system. So, again, thanks a lot for joining us. I can't wait to listen in on the next one. Hey, thanks, Josh. Take care now. You too. Marshall Criswell joining us on Indiana in the Morning for our Marshall Law segment. Our interviews are brought to you are presented by Marcus and Mack, a law firm representing injured people. And this is Indiana in the Morning, presented by First Commonwealth Bank on the voice of Indiana County, WCCS, AM 1160 and 101.1 FM. 101.1 FM. 101.1 FM.